Good morning again, everyone. Um, we gather for the last time, perhaps, in, in just this format, as next week we're planning to open our doors for gathered worship for the first time since March the 15th. And what a long time it seems to have been. Um, a long journey, and as I've said repeatedly, it probably isn't quite over yet. Um, I want to begin this morning by, by once more laying out the safety measures that we would like to be keep in place and we'll be asking you to father as, follow as we gather. Um, because things won't just go back to normal for, for quite some time. And so first let me clarify that we are gathering for what we have known as our worship hour or our sermon hour only. There will be no Sunday school classes um, at this time, at least at first. Um, as we come back together, we'll see how things go. And when it seems appropriate and safe, we'll begin having our children's Sunday school and our Sunday school classes once more. Uh, so let's plan to gather anywhere from, you know, around 1030 so that we can be ready to go and ready to begin streaming our worship service at 1045 as we have been doing um, as close to that as possible. Remember the perspective that we're asking you to keep as we gather again is that you are the one who is contagious. And from that perspective, let that guide you into how you should behave in relationship uh, to others. Again, we'll ask you to follow these guidelines as we come together. The first and important is if you are sick in any way and not feeling well, please stay home. Um, we, we grant you permission to do that in ways that uh, perhaps we haven't done in the past, feeling a sense of responsibility to be here even when we weren't feeling very well. As we move forward, if you're not feeling very well, um, stay home, join us online, um, be well, be safe. Please wear a mask, we will make those available or you can bring one of your own. Please refrain from close contact, physical contact with people such as handshakes and hugs and those types of things. That's going to be tough. It's going to be hard for us to come together and, uh, and not greet each other in that way. But to the extent possible, please refrain. We will be spaced apart in the sanctuary uh, in such a way that every other pew will be, will be unoccupied. And... Uh, would ask beyond that, that you do your best to maintain appropriate social distance. We will not be passing the remote mic or the offering baskets hand to hand. We'll come up with some other ways of, um, of receiving the offering. And even, the ch even though the church will have been disinfected by the time we gather um, to the extent possible, avoid um, touching surfaces like handrails and doorknobs and those types of things. While singing increases the risk of the virus's spread, um, we will be singing somehow. I know that people are looking forward to that and I am too. So we will be singing in some way. So come rejoice with us. Even with all this in mind, it will seem so good and something about it will seem so right uh, to gather with all of you again. And I'm really looking forward uh, to being together. And for those of you who are not yet ready for that, to gather publicly, know that our hearts are with you also. And please continue to join us online as we uh, begin streaming our 
worship services and our messages. And remember everyone, uh, do your best to stay safe. Now on to my meditation for the morning. And this one comes, this one is sparked by an email that was sent to um, Ohio Conference pas pastors from our conference minister, Dick Barrett, who a couple of weeks ago uh, sent an email saying that during this uh, time of coronavirus stay at home orders, he's had op more opportunity to listen to Ohio Conference pastors preach than he had before when he had to physically visit different congregations in order to um, have the opportunity to hear other pastors preaching. And he asked a very probing question after the experience of listening to messages from a number of us. He asked the question, are we really preaching Christ? Almost a Dr. Tim Keller kind of question to ask. That got me that got me thinking about how rarely over the years I have prepared and delivered a salvation message that lifts up Jesus as Lord and Savior. Um, my messages, as they've been for these last number of weeks, and as I look, think back over my years of pastoring, my messages are often lifted from the scriptures and intended to help us make a connection between the scriptures and how we live our lives and how we serve others. Um, I'm, I, I don't think of myself as a deeply theological person. Um, I don't, uh, I, I, I like what the psalmist says, and I try to live by what the psalmist says when he says, to the Lord, I don't trouble myself with things too wonderful for me to know. And I recognize in my relationship with God that there is there are vastly, there's just a vast amount that's just too wonderful for me to know. But what I can know from scriptures, I have felt um, that it's very important to make it applicable and to put it into practice in my life and to encourage you to do the same. But in the course of doing that, it really struck me how rarely, how few times over the years I have actually uh, prepared and delivered Christ-centered salvation type messages. I don't consider, I wouldn't call myself to be an evangelist in that sense thinking of myself more as a shepherd of helping to guide people in living their lives. But that, that thought process in turn uh, leads to a time or led me to a time of reflection about what salvation actually means to me and what it should mean to us or what it can mean to us. And that led to some deeper reflection and some study again going back to the scriptures and some of what they have to tell us. So out of that, in Luke the 19th chapter, we find Jesus saying something very interesting as he dines in the home of Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector, and in the words of the people, a sinner. Let me bring up the screen and we will look at these scriptures together. In Luke 19 verses 1 through 6, Jesus entered Jericho and passing through a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see Jesus who was, he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short and could not see over the crowd, he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, for I must stay at your house today. 
And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now, I give half of my possession to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. In response to Zacchaeus saying, that he would correct or repay any wrongs that he may have done, Jesus says, today's salvation has come to this house. What did that mean then? And what does that mean for us? What is salvation? And how did Jesus' presence in the house or in the home of Zacchaeus, and in response to Zacchaeus making this kind of commitment, how, did, how does that equate, or how does that equal or bring about salvation? What does it tell us about the salvation that Jesus brings? When we think about that, what is salvation? In Exodus, the 15th chapter, Moses and the Israelites break forth into song after crossing the Red Sea the parting of the Red Sea, and after they crossed on dry ground, and then watched as the sea came back in, flooding out the pursuing Egyptian armies, and realizing that they now stood safe on the other side, in Exodus 15, they break into song. And that song opens with these words, these lines. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. It's here in these verses that the word salvation is mentioned for the first time in scriptures in the NIV. There are two earlier times that salvation will show up in the King James Version, um, one in Genesis and one in Exodus. Two earlier references, but they are translated in NIV as the word deliverance. Precisely because that's exactly what this word means. That's exactly what the Hebrew word Yeshua means. It means deliverance. It's derived from the Hebrew yasha, which means open wide, free, or safe. And in singing these words, Moses and the people of Israel, the Israelites, put two concepts together that become very critical, I think, for us in understanding who Jesus is in name and in fact. For when they say, the Lord is my strength and my song, and that's the way some translations would put that, the Lord is my strength and my defense. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. They are putting together the word for the Lord, Yah, or Yehovah, the, the holy name, the unspoken name of God, they are putting that word together with Yeshua, Yah Yeshua. Words that taken together mean the Lord saves or the Lord is salvation. Those words become in the Old Testament, the name Joshua. And when we come over into the New Testament, those exact words become the Greek, Jesus, or Jesus. So that is the name. That is the meaning of the name, Jesus. The Lord saves. In the New Testament, 
in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Luke has Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, bursting into prophetic song at the birth of his son, John, much the same way that Moses and the Israelites just burst into song when they realized that they had been delivered. Zechariah bursts into prophetic song, and in this song, he expands upon what salvation means. In Luke 1, 67 through 72, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days, all of our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord and prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the path of peace. As I said, in this song, he expands on what salvation means. In the opening lines, he says that the Lord has raised up for us a horn of salvation in the house of his servant, David. And here he uses the Greek word, uh, soteria, soteria which means the same as the Hebrew Yeshua, to deliver, to rescue, to save. And he goes on to say what that entails. As we read through that prophetic song, he talks about being delivered from our enemies. He talks about having the mercy of God extended to us, being rescued from oppression, he talks about it giving us the ability to live and serve in holiness and righteousness, of having a knowledge of salvation. He talks about it being a forgiveness of sin. The light, the coming of light into times and places of darkness and into, and into the shadow of death, overcoming the shadow of death. And he talks about it being guidance into the way of peace. All of that flows from our Heavenly Father through the salvation that Jesus is in name and in person. As I read these things, and especially this song of Zechariah and all of these different things that salvation means, as I read this, I think about my own experience, my own relationship with Jesus over the years. And as I reflected on that, I became acutely aware that my what my salvation has meant and means, that it means different things to me and has meant different things to me at different times. There are times that I am burdened by the awareness of just how sinful I am, much like Paul in Romans chapter 7 that I am prone to being sinful. And it's in these moments that salvation means being freed from that burden of sin. There was a time in my life when I was hopelessly lost in the agony of grief, wanting only to die and being done with life. Salvation at that time meant being lifted from that dark shadow of death. There have been times when in my anger and frustration, I have wanted to hurt 
or destroy. And salvation then, on a number of occasions, has been a spirit that turns me away from my selfish urges and guides me into the way of peace. Salvation has meant and means so much more as my life unfolds. And I fully expect that it will lead to a freedom to die when that time comes, saying as Paul did, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. One realization that I have as I contemplate this is that salvation is not static. It is not an event or momentary happening. It is not a one and done, but rather it's a dynamic force that a relationship with Jesus brings into my life that changes to meet my needs at any given time, such that I, I cannot say, I'm saved and stop there. As much as I need to be aware that in Christ, I am being saved. And thus my title for the morning, being saved. And my needs tomorrow are not going to be the same as my needs were yesterday. My needs next year will not be what they were in previous years. And if anything, this strange time of stay at home, this pandemic time should be teaching us that. None of us expected as we came into 2020 that our lives would turn out in the way that they are. And salvation, the salvation that Christ brings, because he is salvation, the salvation changes with our needs so that we can know, so that I can know, that I'm being saved for my tomorrows, for coming years, and for that moment of my death, that I'm being saved. So I hesitate to say I am saved. It's nothing that I can claim. It's nothing that I can stick a feather in my cap and go on from here. But I can have the confidence in Christ that as I trust in him and devote my life to him, that I'm being saved. So as is usual for me, I will ask you, what about you? What does salvation mean to you? This moment, this time in your life, with all of its pressing needs, what would salvation look like and feel like? What burdens do you bear that need to be lifted? From what bondage do you long for deliverance? Where and to whom do you look for your healing, for your hope, for acceptance, for belonging, for purpose, for freedom, for release? Listen to the words of Peter in Acts chapter 4 as Peter responds to the religious leaders, criticizing them after a healing of a paralyzed man at the gate of the temple. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and we're being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And this, such an important verse, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Salvation is found in no one else. 
And I would say it's found in nowhere else. That name, Jesus, Yah Yeshua, the Lord is salvation, is such that when we say Jesus saves, we're being redundant because that's the meaning of the word or that's the meaning of the name. But maybe we should say Jesus saves. Maybe that redundancy is a good thing because Jesus saves, saves. The Lord saves, 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 and saves again. I hope and pray that in this moment in your life, no matter what your needs are, that you can come to know that salvation is found only and only found in humbling yourself before the Lord and in trusting fully in him. And then you too can begin being saved. Let's pray together. The Lord God, thank you for the gift of salvation and all that it means. And thank you that all that it means is bound up in the name. As Paul says in Philippians, you gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Yah Yeshua, Every knee will bow and every tongue confess in heaven and on earth that Jesus is Lord. I thank you that we have this salvation as a living and dynamic force in our lives, delivering, rescuing, forgiving, healing, lifting us up enabling us to stand before you in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives, as Zechariah said. You indeed are salvation. And you indeed have made a way so that we can be delivered and we can, be st we can stand before you as your children. And for that, we praise your name. And I pray that each one of us would commit ourselves to this on a daily basis, making it a living, changing reality in our lives as our needs change, that your salvation is constantly there and meeting all those needs. That our Jesus is alive within us. And we praise your name for that. And now to him who is able to keep you from falling, to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory in his church and in Christ Jesus our Lord throughout all generations and forevermore. And I'm looking forward once again to being able to declare with all of you, amen. Peace and shalom. Once again, our contact information um, for any, any communication you would like to have with us. The address is on the screen. There is a site for online giving. We encourage you to uh, continue to support the congregation and the service that we do in the community and beyond. And if there are any uh, prayer requests or suggestions, you can email those to the email address there or call me at my home number listed there. Once again, thank you very much for joining us again. For those of you who will be gathering next week with us, look forward to that. And for those of you who will continue to follow us online, we will see you again in this format next week.